Professor James Matthews was not easily impressed. With 25 years of experience, as a mathematician at Cambridge University, his world was one of numbers, patterns, and irrefutable logic. An atheist since the age of 16, he had spent his career proving that everything in the universe could be explained mathematically without the intervention of supernatural forces. I never believed in religious texts, he stated in an interview with Science Today. To me, they were merely products of human thought from the past, attempting to explain the world before we had proper scientific methods. Religion was a primitive way of understanding reality, now replaced by science. Born and raised in an academic environment, his father a physics professor and his mother a molecular biology researcher, Matthews grew up with the conviction that only science could provide the right answers. In school he constantly challenged his religious education teachers, demanding empirical evidence for every supernatural claim taught. I still remember when I was 12, challenging my religious teacher to prove the existence of God, he recalled with a smile. She could only answer that some things must be accepted on faith. For my analytical mind, that was a completely unsatisfactory answer. However, all the beliefs he had built over decades began to waver when a Muslim student in his class challenged him with a simple question that would change his life forever. The atmosphere in the advanced mathematics lecture hall at Cambridge University that afternoon felt ordinary. Matthews was explaining complex probability theory when a student named Zakaria raised his hand. Professor Matthews, may I ask a question that's slightly off topic? Zakaria asked politely. Matthews, known for enjoying challenging intellectual discussions, nodded. Professor, if you found a mathematical pattern in an ancient text that would have been impossible for humans to create 1400 years ago, would it make you question your beliefs about its origins? The student asked calmly. Matthews gave a dismissive smile, an expression that often appeared when facing questions he considered naive. He adjusted his glasses and replied, Of course, but such patterns don't exist. Any book, even the most ancient ones, will have some mathematical coincidences if we look hard enough. The human brain is programmed to find patterns, even in random data, that's why we often see faces in clouds or patterns in the stars. What about the Quran, professor? Have you ever analyzed it mathematically? Zakaria asked again. No, I haven't, Matthews replied. But I'd wager the results would be the same as with all other ancient texts. Statistical coincidences that can be explained by standard probability laws. Zakaria smiled. Perhaps you should try it, Professor. As scientists, shouldn't we test hypotheses before drawing conclusions? This challenge piqued Matthew's curiosity. As someone who always upheld the scientific method, he felt compelled to prove his argument. He decided to demonstrate that the Quran, like other texts, possessed no mathematical special properties. He was determined to prove that claims about a mathematical code in the Quran were merely illusions created by those who wanted to see them. He had no idea what he was about to discover. Matthew's computational laboratory at Cambridge was a room filled with high-performance computers and whiteboards covered with complex mathematical equations. This is where he began what he initially considered a simple exercise to prove there was nothing special about the mathematical structure of the Quran. When I started I was 100% certain I would find random patterns, said Matthews. That's what always happens when we analyze texts deeply enough. Our minds are programmed to find meaning even in randomness. Matthews took a systematic approach. He developed specialized computer algorithms to analyze the Quran text in its original Arabic. His goal was simple to look for random patterns that would prove claims about a mathematical code were merely statistical coincidences. With the help of his colleague Dr. Sarah Thompson, a computational linguistics expert, Matthews developed a program that could count the frequency of words, letters, and phrases in the Quran. The program could also analyze more complex numerical structures, such as geometry of values, numerical values of Arabic letters, and the positions of certain words. However, instead of finding randomness, the computers began showing something very different. The patterns that emerged were so structured that Matthews initially thought there was an error in his algorithm. I thought our program had a bug, he recalled. The results we were getting were too regular, too structured, it didn't make statistical sense. After repeatedly checking their program and ensuring there were no errors, Matthews and Thompson began analyzing the results they had obtained. And what stood out most was the recurring appearance of the number 19. In the structure of the Quran, the number 19 appeared repeatedly in ways that made no statistical sense. 
The opening statement of the Quran, Bismillah Hiraman Irahim, which begins 113 of the 114 chapters, consists of exactly 19 Arabic letters. The word Allah appears in the Quran exactly 2698 times, a number divisible by 19 2698, divided 19 equals 142. The word Rahman, the compassionate appears 57 times, also divisible, by 1957 divided 19 equals 3. E. The word Rahman, the merciful appears 114 times, also divisible by 19 114 divided 19 equals 6. The number of words between the first and last mention of Allah in the Quran is 19 142. Dr. Thompson, initially more skeptical than Matthews, ran her own independent analysis. I was convinced James had made an error in his methodology, she said. So I designed my own algorithm from scratch. To my surprise, I found the same patterns, and even discovered additional ones. As a computational linguist, I've analyzed texts from every major civilization and time period, Dr. Thompson explained. The degree of mathematical structure in the Quran is unlike anything I've ever seen. We applied the same analytical techniques to other religious and secular texts from the same era, none showed anything remotely similar. One or two coincidences I could accept, said Matthews, but dozens of interconnected patterns. The probability is nearly impossible. Matthews then developed further statistical tests. He analyzed the likelihood of all these patterns appearing by chance in a text the length of the Quran. I calculated that the probability of all these patterns occurring by chance is less than one in one trillion, he explained. As a mathematician, I couldn't ignore this figure. It's like flipping a coin and getting heads 50 times in a row, theoretically possible, but extremely unlikely to occur naturally. The deeper Matthews researched, the more patterns he found. His next discoveries were even more surprising. The Quran has 114 chapters, a number divisible by 19 114 divided 19 equals 6. The total number of verses in the Quran is 6,236, which when added to the number of chapters 114 gives 6,350. A number divisible by 19 6,350 divided 19 equals 334. The first chapter of the Quran, al fatihat consists of seven verses, and the first word of each verse, when their numerical values gematria are summed, produces a number divisible by 19. The number 19 itself is mentioned only once in the Quran, in chapter 74 verse 30. And if we add 74 plus 30, the result is 104, which when added to 19 gives 123, a number divisible by 19 123 divided 19 equals 6. 47. When Matthews presented his findings, at a mathematics department meeting, his colleagues' reactions varied. Some were skeptical, some interested, and others seemed uncomfortable with the implications of the findings. Professor Richard Dawkins, a colleague known for his strong atheistic views, challenged Matthews, James you know perfectly well that if we look hard enough, we'll find any pattern in any data. This is just apophenia the tendency to see patterns in random data. Matthews nodded in understanding. Richard, that was the first objection I raised to myself. But this isn't just about finding a few random patterns. This is a structured system integrated throughout the text. These patterns are interconnected and consistent. And more importantly, I've tested the same methodology on other ancient texts, the Iliad, the Mahabharata, even the Bible, and none have such a consistent mathematical structure. Dr. Emma Chen, a statistical analyst, raised another point. Have you considered the possibility of selection bias? Perhaps you're only counting patterns that fit your hypothesis and ignoring those that don't. A valid concern, Matthews replied. To address this, we designed a double-blind protocol where my team analyzed texts without knowing which was which. We included the Quran alongside other texts from the same period. The results were consistent, only the Quran showed these integrated numerical patterns. Matthews spent three full months analyzing all aspects of the Quran's numerical structure. He tested and recalibrated algorithms, trying to find alternative explanations. He even invited skeptics and critics to review his methodology, ensuring there was no bias or error in his approach. As a skeptic, 
My job is to look for rational explanations, he explained. But the more I looked, the clearer it became that these patterns were too complex, too consistent, and too structured to appear by chance. For weeks after his initial discovery, Matthews experienced what he described as an intense inner war. As a scientist who had always based his beliefs on empirical evidence, he now faced evidence that challenged his entire worldview. I couldn't sleep, he admitted. I kept thinking about the implications of what I had found. If the Quran indeed has a mathematical structure that was impossible for humans to create 1400 years ago, then what does that mean? Does this imply a higher power? Does this mean God is real? At this point, Matthews faced an intellectual crisis. His entire life view was built on the belief that everything could be explained without God. Yet here, in undeniable numbers, his own field of expertise, he found evidence pointing to a different conclusion. With his mind in turmoil, Matthews decided to step back from his research. He took leave from the university and went to the Scottish Highlands to clear his mind. In the silence of the mountains, he began reading the Quran, not as an object of mathematical research, but to understand its message. I was surprised to find that the Quran repeatedly encourages humans to use their reason, to contemplate the universe, to seek knowledge, he said. This was very different from what I had imagined about religious texts. One passage particularly struck him, we will show them our signs in the horizons, and within themselves, until it becomes clear to them that it is the truth. Quran 41:53. As a scientist I had always looked for signs, evidence in the natural world, Matthews reflected. Here was a text, telling me to do exactly that, but suggesting that these signs would point to something beyond the material universe. After returning to Cambridge, Matthews continued his research with a new perspective. This time, he focused not only on the mathematical structure of the Quran, but also sought connections between the patterns he found and natural phenomena. What makes this even more extraordinary, added Matthews, is that the Quran was revealed gradually over 23 years. How could someone plan such a complex mathematical structure in a text, revealed piece by piece over more than two decades, without access to computational technology? Matthews also traced the history of mathematics and found that the numerical patterns in the Quran could not possibly have been known to humans in the 7th century. The number system we use now, the decimal system based on 10, was not known in Arabia, at that time, he explained. The concept of zero, which is essential in modern mathematics, was only introduced to the Arab world, several centuries after the Quran was revealed. So how could someone design such a complex mathematical structure without these basic mathematical tools? Considering that Muhammad, the messenger who brought the Quran, was illiterate, this discovery became even more extraordinary. We used high-performance computers and complex algorithms to find these patterns, said Matthews. Imagining a human in the 7th century designing such a structure without the aid of modern technology seems impossible. Dr. Lawrence Peterson, a longtime colleague, confronted Matthews after a presentation, James, you're throwing away decades of rational thinking for what? Some numerical curiosities in an ancient text. Not curiosities, Lawrence, Matthews replied calmly. Statistically significant patterns that defy explanation by our current understanding. Isn't that precisely what science is supposed to investigate? Phenomena we can't yet explain, but to jump to supernatural explanations. Peterson pressed, I'm not jumping anywhere, Matthews said. I'm following the evidence step by step. As scientists, if we find data that doesn't fit our current models, we don't dismiss it, we revise our models. Matthew's change did not happen overnight. As a scientist he spent weeks studying the Quran in depth, not only its mathematical structure but also its teachings. I found that the Quran consistently encourages the use of reason, observation and reflection, the same values I've always upheld as a scientist. He there are more than 800 verses that encourage humans to think, reflect, and seek knowledge. Matthews was also surprised to find verses describing natural phenomena in scientifically accurate ways, such as human embryology, the expansion of the universe, and the layers of the atmosphere. How could a book from the 7th century contain scientific information that was only confirmed in the modern era, he wondered. This added to the mystery about the origins of the Quran. During his research process, Matthews began interacting with the Muslim community. 
He attended lectures at Islamic centers, discussed with scholars, and even started learning Arabic to understand the Quran more deeply. I met many Muslim scientists and academics who, like me, valued critical thinking and evidence-based research, he said. They helped me understand that in Islam, faith and science are not in conflict, both are ways of understanding truth. Eventually, the undeniable mathematical evidence, plus the Quran's message that resonated with his heart, led Matthews to a conclusion he never expected. I could no longer ignore the evidence, he said. As a mathematician who has spent a lifetime seeking truth through numbers, I had to admit, the Quran could not possibly have been written by humans 1400 years ago. Its mathematical structure is too perfect, too complex. On March 19th symbolically, amidst a shocked academic community, Professor James Matthews recited the Shahada and officially embraced Islam. Today I stand before you not just as a mathematician, but also as someone who has found truth through my research, he said, at a departmental meeting. Ironically, the same knowledge I once used to deny God has become the path that led me to him. The reaction from the academic community was mixed. Some of his colleagues welcomed his decision with respect, while others felt he had betrayed scientific principles. Dr. Jennifer Wilder, head of the physics department, expressed her disappointment. James was one of our most brilliant minds. To see him succumb to religious thinking is, well, it's a significant loss for rational inquiry. On the other hand, Dr. Michael Thompson, a respected neurologist, had a different perspective. Science doesn't have all the answers yet, and may never have. What Matthews has done is follow evidence where it led him. Isn't that what we're all supposed to do as scientists? I understand the skepticism, Matthews said, in response to criticism. If someone had come to me two years ago and told me a story like this, I would have laughed it off. But I can only say do your own research. Look at the data. As scientists we must follow the evidence, not our preconceptions. Matthews began writing a book about his discoveries, titled The Mathematical Miracle, How Numbers Led an Atheist to God. He also opened a new course at the university on the relationship between mathematics and ancient texts. The course quickly became the most popular in the department, with students from diverse backgrounds, believers and non-believers alike, eager to examine the evidence for themselves. I don't ask my students to reach the same conclusions I did, Matthews explained. I only ask that they approach the data with an open mind and rigorous methodology. Matthew's story has sparked debate throughout the global scientific community. Dr. Elizabeth Chen, a researcher at MIT, commented Professor Matthew's findings are intriguing. As scientists we need to be open to all possibilities, even those that challenge our worldview. Meanwhile, critics like Dr. Robert Hines from Stanford remain skeptical. Mathematical patterns can be found anywhere, if we look hard enough. This doesn't prove divine origin. Matthews responded to criticism calmly. I invite all skeptics to review my methodology and replicate my research. Science progresses through questions and challenges. I'm not asking anyone to reach the same conclusions. I'm only asking them to investigate with an open mind. Today, Professor Matthews continues to teach mathematics at Cambridge. However, he now also lectures on the mathematical miracles of the Quran at leading universities around the world. His research has brought a new perspective to the dialogue between science and religion. Numbers don't lie, he says, simply. And the numbers in the Quran speak very clearly to those willing to listen. Matthew's transformation from a prominent atheist to a believing Muslim shows that honest intellectual pursuit can lead to unexpected places. What I found in the mathematics of the Quran was not just number patterns, but a door to an entirely new dimension of understanding, he reflects. It reminds us that there may be more to this universe than our current scientific models can explain. Matthews now dedicates his life not only to mathematics, but also to building bridges of understanding between the worlds of science and spirituality. He believes that both, when viewed correctly, are never in conflict. In the end, he says, both science and faith are about seeking truth. And truth, in all its forms, always leads to the same source. If you're interested in the scientific evidence in the Quran, don't forget to subscribe to our channel for similar videos. Share your experience in the comments and let us know what Islamic scientific topics you'd like to see next.